Okay, so let's begin this uh, course by kind of taking a look at what is different from what we've learned before. Oh. We've learned about Python. So let's write down here, let's say here is Python and here is C slash C++. Okay. Uh, now I say C, C++ because C is actually a subset of C++. Um, first of all, perhaps maybe we should, you know, try and um, look at the differences between what are the what are some of the differences between uh, C and C++. So one of the differences is that C++ is an object-oriented programming language and C is not. Another difference is that C++ uh, has something called you can make templates in them and there's something associated with this and C doesn't have that. Although in terms of object-oriented programming C does have structs but that's not really fully object-oriented it's more like just a container uh, to put different data types into. But the templates allows you to write code that is written in generic form, so for any data type. So we'll say, usually we say the word generics, and this is in the form of the STL. And the STL is the standard template library. And this, uh, C doesn't have this. What are some examples of the generics with the STL? Well, one of them is called vector. And another one, now there's many of them, but these are just two, two examples. Another one is called a map. Now, I know you don't know what these are, but if I give you the equivalent, you'll understand immediately what they are as, as soon as I give you the equivalent in Python. That's a list in a Python and that is a dictionary in Python. So in other words, C by itself doesn't have the ability to have a list like object or a dictionary like object. That's included with the C++ language with the standard template library. However, we have to remember something. Okay, We have to remember that both Python and C++ is written in C. Not only that, but operating systems, like for example, the Linux kernel, or uh, I believe Windows itself is also written in C. So I don't want you to think that C is uh, not worth learning or that it's kind of uh, an old language. It's still very relevant. Um, it's very, it's, it's lower level. Okay, so let's talk about high level, low level. What is high level and what is low level? It's got nothing to do with which is better or worse. Higher level language just means that it's closer to English. So Python is a very high level language and uh, C is a lower level language. I would say Python is definitely higher level than C++, uh, but a, a lower level language than C would be, let's say, uh, assembler. Now, I don't remember how to code in assembler anymore. I did that when I was in university, uh, I think just once, and um, it's very tedious, and it's not easy to write code in assembler and for productivity reasons. So here's the thing, as you go up this, as you go higher level, your productivity goes up, okay? So in other words, if two people had the same amount of experience in Python and C++, the, per the person who knows Python would be quicker at writing the program, okay? That's generally true. However, it doesn't necessarily uh, have anything to do with how fast the program will execute. Uh, C++ is a faster language than Python is, 
for a number of reasons, which we'll discuss shortly. But um, the, my point here is that Python is one of the highest level languages in terms of how close it is to English in, in what you're programming. So we kind of started out this discussion with what are the differences between C and C++. And these are some of the, the differences. Um, now, if I come over here and talk about the differences between Python and C++, well, there's a big one here. And this is called dynamic typing. And this is static typing. What does that mean? Well, let me give you an example. Okay, so again, maybe we'll come over here and we'll say Python and C++. Okay, when you declare a variable in Python, you'll go like this. When you when I say declare, it's basically creating. So in Python, really, I only use one term for this, and that's assignment. Okay. This is, this is not a comparison, it's an assignment, right? Which basically means that I am assigning the value, the integer of one, to this name tag. Notice I use the term name tag of x. You could say variable x. But in the next line of code, if I went like this, this is fine. There's no problem with this in Python. And in the next line of code, if I said this, that's totally fine as well. Python won't complain. It'll allow you to use the same name tag to access different objects. So here's the trick, or here's what you need to understand, is that all of these guys in Python are objects. So this is an integer. This is a, a, a float. This is a string. But they're all objects. Whereas in C++, so this is called dynamic typing. Whereas in C++, you can't do this. Um, gosh, this thing keeps popping up, sorry. What you have to do is first you have to declare a variable, and then you have to assign. So you would declare the variable first by saying, let's say int x, and notice there's a semicolon at the end, and then you could say x equals 1. Now what this, is, what this is doing, what this line is doing here is you're telling the operating system that you want to allocate enough space to store an integer. Okay, And then in the next line you're assigning it. So if you just did the declaration, you don't really know what there, if there's any data in that memory location already. There could be. You're not sure. Okay. To be explicit, you should assign as well to guarantee the value of what's stored in that memory location. However, I want to be clear here that you can do both of these in one line. You don't have to do them on separate lines. For example, you could do this. So this will say create, declare a variable x, and then assign it to 1. Or you could do it like this. OK? Both of these are valid ways to do it. Um, however, I need you to understand that one of the reasons why Python is slower than C++ is because of this dynamic typing ability. A name tag, which is the variable name, can refer to any object. Now, if you think about it, then that means in a Python list, you can, you can have a list with a, an integer and then a, a float and a string all inside the list. So, you know, um, 
You could say L equals like this in Python. Now, I'm not teaching Python here, but I'm, I'm showing you that this is possible. So you can't do this in C++ or C. Why? Because when you create a container, it's a, I shouldn't say you cannot. So there is a way to be able to do something similar, but it's with pointers, and it involves classes and subclassing, and uh, we'll get into that much later in the course. However, for all intents and purposes, you, you don't mix data types in a container. So let's say, for example, before I said to you that the, the vector was the equivalent of a list, well, what does, what does C have? Let, let, I'll get, get to that in a second. Th this vector here has to, the, the type of data that it stores has to be consistent. So everything in it has to be of the same type. Now, C also has like a container that you can put things in, and that's called a C array. But one of the limitations of the C array is that it can't grow. So in a Python list, you go, you know, dot append. In a vector, you would do dot pushback. Well, you can't do that to an array because once you make the array, its size is set. Okay? So you, you need, we're going to learn dynamic memory allocation in this course as well, which kind of is a way to deal with that situation. Uh, and it's what, it's how these, it's how this guy uh, handles things under the hood. So, what are some other differences between the languages? Okay, so let's go back to here. Uh, another difference between these languages is the white space. So in Python, white, white space matters. Okay. In other words, when you're writing code, you indent, indenting, right, is part of the language. When you indent, um, that might be a block of code or a function. But in C++, white space does not matter, okay? So you could write a, a C++ program that has no indenting, it would be very difficult to read, and people would be upset with you when they looked at it, but it would still work. I don't recommend you do this. Um, it's funny. If you learn if you learn this language first, as I as I teach it, then students don't usually have any problems indenting properly in C plus plus because it's kind of ingrained into you. Okay, so another huge difference between Python and C, C++ is that Python is interpreted and C++ or C is compiled. This is a big difference, okay? Because that means that in Python, you write a .py file that's your source code, okay? And when you run it, you simply run it by typing, for example, you can run it by going Python and then your .py file. Whereas in C++, your source code is going to be a .cc file. Now, now there's many different, actually, extensions. Uh, let's just briefly mention those guys. So in, like, uh, Linux, usually has a .cc. These are all interchangeable. Sometimes Windows uh, uses .cpp. Uh, you can also use um, .cxx. These are all uh, C++ file extensions. And then obviously, right, for C, that one's universal. It's just .c. Okay? But Here's my point. This is your source code. 
So what's source code? That's humanly readable. Notice in Python, you actually run the source code, or at least it looks like you're running the source code. Okay? But what happens is there is a Python virtual machine, and this virtual machine exists for all operating systems. Okay? And so when you write your, your source code, you can run it on any platform. So it's called, it's cross-platform. The reason why it's cross-platform is because if you go to python.org, you can, you can download the, the Python interpreter for any operating system, and you install it. However, listen carefully. How does it work in C++? So this is kind of interesting because it's kind of like a plus uh, and a minus in some ways. So the difference here is that once you write your source code, you now have to compile it with a compiler. Now there are different uh, compilers. So if we kind of go to the internet here and take a look, there's a whole bunch of different compilers uh, for C++. And the ones, were, the ones I would say that are the most uh, popular ones, so Clang LLVM is super popular and excellent. Okay, uh, The license for this one, by the way, is um, more permissive. So, so Clang LLVM is um, very good and many, many, many projects use that. The other one, I would say there's like the top three I'm going to name, at least in my opinion. So one of them is Clang, LLVM. And then the other one is the one we're using in this classroom, and that's G++ or GCC. And uh, I'm not going to go through all the features. You can look that up on Wikipedia yourself. But the, so the other one, the other really big one, Intel has one as well, although that's not the, I would say, the other huge one. The other huge one is Microsoft. Uh, and that is in the Microsoft, you can, you can get it in the uh, free version of Microsoft uh, Visual Studio 2019, I think is the latest one as of this time. And uh, it comes with uh, Visual C++. So, so Microsoft has its own uh, compiler for Windows, C++ compiler for Windows. So, um, yeah. So those are the, I would say those are the big ones. Uh, and like I said, we're going to be using uh, G++. Now, if you're using Windows, I would recommend that you download this software. It's called codeblocks.org. So if I go back here and oops went too far so codeblocks.org here it is and you can go to downloads and basically what this is is it's a IDE integrated development environment which also comes with a C++ compiler so if you go to uh, download binary releases and you go to Windows. Notice they have them for Mac as well. Uh, on Linux you wouldn't really do this because you could just use your package manager to download G++. And so here the question is which one would you download? Seems like there's quite a few of them, right? So my guess is nobody's using a 32-bit Windows so you're using a 64-bit and the one you want is this one which uh, has Minji W in the name and basically what that means is it it's, tells you down here it's gonna come with the G++ uh, compiler built in so so um, so anyways that's a that's an easy way to get a compiler but here's my this is what I want kinda wanted to discuss let's go back to the to the differences right that's where we came from so how is this compiler different from the interpreter? 
So let's say, for example, you write a Python source code and you want to have somebody else run it. Well, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to tell that other person to install Python first on their computer and then they can take your source code and run it. Now there is a way to change Python uh, into bytecode, but the point here is that when you use a compiler to change source code into machine code, then you can take that in Windows they're called .exe and in Linux they're just called uh, binary. You can take that binary executable and just give it to the person and they can run it on their computer uh, and they don't need to install anything else. Okay, So in other words, if you compile your, your source code and then you distribute your binary file, uh, other people will be able to simply run it without having to install a compiler. So how is C++ cross-platform? And the answer to that is that it's called write once, compile anywhere. In other words, if you if you write your source code on a Linux machine and then you want to have somebody if you if you compile it and turn it into a binary you cannot give that binary file to a person on Windows and expect them to run it won't okay and vice versa the binary files are not cross-platform only the source code is cross-platform so if you want to write your program once, but you want to distribute it for all platforms, you would have to compile it three times. Once for every operating system. And then people could download that. Does that make sense? So that's kind of the basics of what's different. Obviously there's some other differences, like for example in um, in Python, you know, comments are hashtags. In in C C++, comments are like are forward slash forward slash two of them. Or you can comment with a forward slash star on multi-line comments. You can you know, and then you can have lines of comments and then another star. Notice it's not the same character. This is not the same. It's two characters. Forward slash star begins the comments and then star forward slash ends the comments. And this, this is a single line comment, so forward slash forward slash. Okay, You can do multi-line comments in Python 2 with triple quotes. Okay. Um, the other thing, obviously, I kind of already mentioned this, right, was white space. But in, in C++, when you have block of code, you have to use braces for blocks of code. Whereas in, in Python, it's, it's indenting that uh, specifies your block of code. OK, so let's dive into uh, the most simple, basic C++ program there is. And it's the Hello World. OK, so um, I've got some comments up here. So some things you, let's start at the top and then we'll kind of discuss what these comments are later. So this include IO stream. This is actually specifically for, we'll say required here. Oops. This is, can't type. Required for C out. Now, we'll get to that in a second, but this is kind of like, from a Python perspective, this is kind of like importing a library. Notice in Python, you don't have to import anything to print, right? But in C++, you actually have to include an external library. Uh, I don't know if external is the correct word, but you have to include IO stream 
that stands for input output stream in order to use C out. So what is C out? It's the equivalent of print, but it stands for console output. Okay? So let me draw you a little picture of what streams are. So let me draw you this picture here. I'll kind of pull this over. Let's say this is your C++ program. Now you have a stream flowing into your program and you have you can have more than these two, but these two are really the basic ones. This is coming in to your program, and this is going out of your program. This is usually uh, coming from your keyboard, okay? And this is going to your this is going out to your monitor. But another name for monitor is, uh, you could call it your terminal, and another name for terminal is console, terminal console. So this word console is where the C out word comes from, because that's console output. Okay? And then we'll, we'll talk about input in a, in a later. So the one thing I wanted to mention here is that these arrows going in and out of your program, these are streams. Okay, these are called streams. And this is an input stream and this is an output stream. And that's why we have to include IO stream in order to use C out. Okay, so let's go back to our code. And um, that's line eight. So now, what? How do we start writing our program? So what you have to understand is that all of your code in C plus plus or C has to be inside functions. So this line ten is actually a function declaration, or we're, we're declaring a function here. Unlike Python. You know, in Python, when you write code, here, I'll, I'll kind of just kind of scroll down here a little bit. And, oops. And show you that, you know, how do we write Python code? It would be like if I wanted to write a, uh, a function called main, I would just go like this, right? Well, what's included in this line? The, the name of the function but also the word def here. But you notice there's nothing in this line that indicates what will be returned in this function. So that's how Python works. But C++ is different. The first thing that has to appear in the definition of a function, the line, is the variable type, or I should say the data type, that the function will return. So that when I see this int, it means that this function will return an integer, and indeed it does on line 12. Okay. Uh, right now, this this function doesn't accept anything. And and to start out the function, I have my opening scope brace, and of course it's closed by my end scope. Notice this line doesn't end in a semicolon, but the other lines within it must. Also notice this line does not need a semicolon. Okay, the include line. And also the include lines start with a hashtag. That's not a comment. Okay. Now, what is this? <coughs> STD. STD stands for standard namespace. And the two uh, full colons is called the scope resolution operator. Then we say, OK, let's send something to the output uh, stream, which is the console output. And we use the insertion operator. And notice here I have the comment for what that is. The two less than symbols placed next to each other is called the insertion operator. So what you're doing is 
you are inserting the string, hello world, and, it's, and I know it's a string because it's in double quotes, you are inserting it into the output stream. And that will lead to, the, to your monitor. Here's an excellent question. Can the string, <coughs> like Python, be single quotes? And the answer is no. This is incorrect. That's because in C++, strings must be in double quotes. Is there a special meaning for a single quote? Yes, there is. It stands for a character, OK? Not a string. What's the difference between a character and a string? A character is only one. So it could be a letter. It could be a number in single quotes, but only one. That's called a character. Okay? As soon as you have more than one, it's, it's a string. So notice here I have return zero. Let's talk about this return zero. Uh, what is that? What is the significance of that? And where does that where is that return to? Because I don't see a call to main anywhere here, right? Like you might ask, where is the code that calls the main function? Because this is a function. And the answer is, are you ready for this? There, there is no code that calls main. Main is called directly by the operating system. So watch this. Let's, let me save this. And then we're going to uh, we're going to compile and 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 run this, but I want to show you what this this is actually called the here. Let me put a comment here. This is the exit code. So when your program finishes, it re it returns an exit code to the operating system. Okay, and let me take you, let me show you what that looks like. So. Here you can see if I type in ls, I have uh, both my source code and the green file is actually my binary. Let me actually delete the binary. Okay, so I've just got my source code now. You can see what's in it. Right, it's it's the same thing as what's in my editor. However, let me <coughs> do like an ls, and now. It, now, ls is a program, right? Was this successful? I can check my last run program exit code by typing echo dollar sign question mark. Now, this is not C++. This is actually part of Linux. And then when I do that, you can see that it shows me zero. What this means now is that, I'll say it again, listen carefully, the last executed program's exit code is displayed, which was zero. In other words, ls exited successfully. That's what the zero signifies. It signifies exit successfully. So I mean, I could go back here and uh, exit code success, right? Because that's what zero signifies. However, <clears throat> let's try something that's going to fail. Ready? I'll go ls uh, something like that. And now notice ls failed. It gives me a failure message. But let's try the echo command again. Let's see what we get. Notice now it doesn't say 0. So somehow ls failed. Now, I'll just say anything other than 0 is failure. But usually, okay, usually, uh, a, like a, the simplest failure would be exit code 1. Okay, so if you just want to express failure upon exit, you would, you would just do this. You could say, here you could say return 1. Now, in this situation, it wouldn't make sense because this is not a failure. <coughs> but Let's say you did have a condition that you could check for failure. And if that was the case, you could exit out of the program with return 1. And then the person running your program would know if your program finished successfully or not.
Okay. Um, so now the question is, all right, well, how are we going to compile this? So let's go to a terminal. Now, listen, I'm going to show you how to do this manually just once. But you'll see that if you're using an IDE, you can actually do this automatically because you're going to be compiling a lot. Every time you make an edit to a program, you're going to have to recompile it and run it again to test to see if your program is working properly. So this is something that is very repetitive in programming. So therefore, people don't usually do this manually. However, it's a good idea to understand what's happening. So let's try it. What are the steps involved? So the first step is let's use the G++ compiler. And if I just type, well, actually, hold on. Um, I think it was. I think it's like G plus plus dash dash. Is it dash dash version? Yeah. Okay. So uh, there's the information about the the compiler, and um, at, at this point, let's go ahead and compile the. So we'll go. Uh, I think it's dash C for compile, and then. We'll run it and look. It didn't. It didn't give me any errors. But now let's take a look. I've got a now. I've got a file called um, hello.o. Okay, that's an object file. Okay, it's actually not executable yet because I. So what I've done there is I've done the compiling. Okay, so I want you to make a note. This was this was to compile. Okay, so the dash C compiles your source code. However, um, we still need to link the object code. By the way, let's take a look at what object code looks like. Ready? This is going to be kind of fun. Okay, so it says it's a binary file. You want to see it anyways? Yes, there it is. Holy smokes. Looks like complete garbage. So it's not humanly readable. Um, however, can we run this? No. We can't. This is not an executable file. We still need to do something else. So <clears throat> let's, let's kind of go back to our notes and let's write down what the two steps are to complete this process. And where was that? Okay, so the two step process is number one, compile. And number two, link. OK? So let's do the linking now. Let's go back to our code, our terminal here. OK, so now that we have our object file, how do we create an executable out of this? So we'll go g++ hello.o, and then We'll go turn this into uh, link it. And when we do that, we get no errors. And now we have another file called hello. And that's green, which, ex which represents the fact that it's executable. Okay, Look at the file permissions here. You can see that. And so when I, I can now run hello just like that by going dot forward slash. And you'll see that, in fact, it says uh, hello world, which is what the program is supposed to do. Now, this seems like a lot of work in terms of like what were the two steps, right? So I'll go over it really quickly again. I'll, I'll just get rid of hello, and I'll get rid of hello.o. Be careful here, OK, what you're deleting. So the two steps, again, were to compile, right? And then to link. And there you go. Now we've got our executable. However, watch this. You can do both steps in one shot, OK? So let me get rid of the executable and let me get rid of the object file. 
And now watch this. If I go G++ hello.cc and I say create my executable hello, this does now both in one step and you don't actually end up creating the object file, it just goes straight to creating the binary executable. So in other words, this does both compiling and linking these two steps in one. Okay? So that's kind of, I mean, usually when I do it, I don't do these separately. I'm just going to do this. Okay? However, having said all this, guess what? Now, so like if I want to run this, obviously now I would go forward slash hello and, and it runs. But G and most IDEs have something built in. So here is the set build commands, okay? And notice here um, they're using wall, which is turn on all warnings. I didn't use that for simplicity uh, on the command line. But you can edit these if you like to build and, um, and then they also have execute. So essentially, now if I kind of look at what um, keys I can press, build is F9 and execute is F5. So watch this. All I have to do is hit F9 and then it tells me down here, compilation finished successfully. And then I can hit F5 and it runs. And it opens up a new window uh, for and and it says and it tells me what the exit code is. Okay, and when I'm finished looking at it, I just hit return and it's gone. So my point is it's genies. There are many other IDEs that integrated development environments that'll do this kind of thing. But I like Genie, it's very simple and it's nice and it serves its purpose. So once again, I don't, I'm not trying to teach you specifically how to use this tool, the, the IDE. I specifically took time to teach you how to do the compiling and the linking on the command line or, or both of them in one shot so that you know what's happening behind the scenes. And like I said, if you want to modify those build commands, you just go up to build and you go set build commands and you can modify them as you wish. And these percent, these percent %E, percent %F, um, those are the names of, uh, the, the F I think is the source code and the E I guess would be the, uh, the executable name. Okay? Okay, so the next thing I want to do is uh, Let's try and write this program such that, no, so I'm not sure if you noticed this, but when you run it in Genie, you won't notice this as much as if you run it here. Notice that I sure would like this hello world to be on a separate line. Why is it that it's kind of hidden behind my command prompt? So I can fix that in a couple of different ways. I could insert a new line character here and I can I, so no, listen I have to save this now right and I have to go back if I run the program again nothing's changed because I haven't compiled it yet so this is what's what you have to remember is that once you make an edit and save it you have to recompile the program then run it again and now notice hello world is on a separate line because I have a new line character. Is that the only way to make it appear? And that is, no. There is another way that's actually better than backslash n. And that is by inserting something else into the stream after hello world. And that something else is called endline. And now endline this is going to fail, and I'm going to show you why it's going to fail. 
uh, and let's just try and see. Save it, switch here, and let's try compiling it. And notice it failed as I said it would. And that's because ENDL is unrecognized. So that is a part of the standard namespace. So I have to do this. And now if I save it, and if I compile it now, it should work. And it does. Here's my point, though. <coughs> so how is this any different from before if I run it? Well, it looks exactly the same. Which one's better? Is it better to put ENDL here? Or is it better to put backslash N in the string? And the answer is, it's better to do ENDL. Why? And the answer is going to surprise you, I think. So um, I learned this when I was debugging. So I had an error in my program. And I was trying to use some C out statements to see where my program was crashing. Uh, it's a very rudimentary way to kind of debug your program, unless it works. But I discovered that if, if I just use backslash n, my program execution passed certain points, and yet those C out statements did not print on the screen. And that's because the buffers were not flushed before the next line executed the buffer is in the output stream. When using ENDL, this guarantees that if my program crashes after this line, so if my crash occurs here, that means that I will still see hello world printed before my crash occurs because the ENDL will flush the output buffers. Whereas putting backslash N the, it may still crash on line 12, but you, you may not see hello world. And so that's, that's to me, that's uh, important. Okay? Um, however, it can get tiring continually typing STD all the time. So you can do this. You can go using name space STD. Now, I can get rid of this. I can just say C out, and this is, how I, this is how I program. I don't usually do it the other way. So let's save this now <coughs> and go back. And if I compile this, it compiles, yay, and now I can run it. Perfect. So notice that's well, let's get rid of this line. That's essentially a simple hello world. And we've kind of explained everything. Remember, and, and I can, I can uh, again, I can use Genie to run this uh, by going F9 to compile and F5 to run. OK? But again, where is the main program being? or sorry, where is the main function being called? And the answer is, it's being at, that is the one function that is called when you execute the program. That gets called by the operating system when you run it. So, but just by doing this, just by doing that, that calls the main function. So what is the, uh, what is the implication of this? It means that every single C or C++ program must have a main function. OK? That you can have other functions, but the main one is the first one that's going to be executed. And then you can call others from that function. Make sense? OK, so one last note. And that is going back to the concept of uh, compiling and, and then, you know, compiling and then linking. 
the compiling part, I think you understand, is, is changing uh, source code into uh, machine code. But what's the linking part? What's, or, or, what's that about? And, and the linking part, what I can explain that as, is that what, what parts of this code have I written? Well, I've written some of it, but not all of it. For example, I didn't write C out. I'm using this library to, oops, I'm using the IO stream library to, um, to use C out. So that part has to be linked in to my binary. And that's something, I didn't write the IO stream. Okay, that's part of the, the standard uh, the GCC library. But I have to link it in order to get that code to be present in my program. So maybe that's a good way of explaining what the linker does. But essentially, the linker creates the executable, the binary executable. Okay? But as I mentioned, uh, building it basically does, in an IDE, does everything all at once. Yeah, so that's our first lesson uh, for this course.